Hello there, this is Dr. Dan Guerra coming to you from Authentic Biochemistry Studios in the in the Pacific Northwest. Today is the very first day of February 2021. Now last time I talked to you about ceramide and the mediation of cellular alterations associated with the mitigation of autophagy versus various forms of programmed cell death. Remember, we're talking about the aging process. I've been emphasizing the central nervous system for some time now, but I do talk quite a bit about the rest of the, the periphery. Today, we're going to really look into that portion of the CNS that is most vulnerable to aging. And I'm going to finally illuminate why I've been talking a great deal about the neuroendocrine system, because we're going to couple that to what actually occurs with changes in metabolism and changes in gene expression as aging proceeds in humans. So that's where we're at and that's where we're going. So let's start. Okay. So <clears throat> now this paper was published only about two years ago not even and we've been referring to it off and on for the last couple of lectures but here i want to get into some serious conversation about lipid metabolism particularly how it's associated with lifespan and I'm not talking about the periphery, I'm not talking about lipoproteins, I'm not talking directly about obesity here. I'm talking about lipid signaling and the regulation of gene expression. <clears throat> so we've talked before about the target of rapamycin or TOR. M, of course, would be the mammalian TOR system. And TOR just means the complex of proteins associated with that master kinase which is basically an anabolic rheostat in the cell, all cells. So notice the title of this uh, slide, mTORC1 signaling in the modulation of cellular metabolism and the or life of the organism. So let's take a look at this in some detail. First of all, we can say that sphingolipids, and here we're talking about sphingosine 1-phosphate and ceramide, only those two lipids, can lead to contrarian mediation of mTORC activity. So this is a statement I'm making, a premise, and this is based on not only this paper, but the last 10 years of research uh, in this field. Now notice what happens here. You've got sphingosine 1-phosphate. Now you know that can be synthesized from ceramide. I showed you that yesterday in lecture and after phosphorylation, right? And then the removal of the fatty acid from ceramide, you make sphingosine 1-phosphate. Now, notice that if it binds to its receptor, it has modulatory effects on this really canonical kinase called AKT. That's what this particular symbolism means. It means depending on what tissue source you're looking at, sphingosine 1-phosphate binding to its receptor will have modulatory effects on AKT. So that means not always in the same direction. Depends on what else is happening in the cell both uh, proximal and distal to this particular axis. However, AKT will activate mTORC. Okay, that's what this arrow means. So when sphingosine 1-phosphate is bound to its receptor and it does activate AKT, AKT will activate mTORC. Now look what happens here. mTORC will influence the protein quality assurance pathway through heat shock proteins like HSB70, 90 and 110, those are molecular masses of the protein. And that will block proteotoxicity. Now remember, that occurs when you have the unfolded protein response, the UPR. And that happens because of a lack of, of appropriate folding, primarily of proteins that are being synthesized and glycosylated for export or signaling through the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus and then eventually perhaps to the plasma membrane, right? So proteotoxicity has to do with damaging 
somehow that protein synthesis, protein translation, and, po and post-translational modification of polypeptides, that they're going to end up being central to modifying and regulating cell fate and signaling. Okay? And this increases with aging. Heat shock proteins are ones first discovered actually in yeast and in Drosophila associated with increasing temperature. That's why they call HSPs. But basically, they act as chaperones um, to control the degradation of proteins. But they can also induce the UPR response in the ER. That's not shown here. Now, so that's how this HSF works. That's the heat shock transcription factor. So this is a transcriptional regulation shutting down proteotoxicity. Okay. Likewise, you have this UNC51-like kinase, the ELK1. The ELK1 is going to turn on autophagy. And autophagy will also help to block proteotoxicity. Because autophagy is going to take things like proteins and break them back down, either through the proteasomal complex after ubiquitin inhalation, or through direct pro, uh, limited proteolysis, such as in endosomes or in lysosomes. And that will serve to remove some of these proteins that were folded incorrectly and therefore could generate the toxicity in the cell. Okay, so this is a positive effect that mTORC has. mTORC also stimulates transcription through the classical S6 kinase. This is shown here. And so you get an enhancement of transcription. That's why mTORC is normally considered to be anabolic, turning on the expression of genes in general, right? <clears throat> But there's some complexity here. So mTORC stimulates transcription via the ribosomal S6K um, kinase and translation, and it does so by blocking this 4E by binding protein 1, because when this protein is allowed to function, it will, it will inhibit this eukaryotic initiation factor 4E, and therefore will inhibit translation. So removing this binding protein with mTORC, because the phosphorylation of the binding protein will not allow it to bind to the um, initiation factor, uh, it, this protein that will, will initiate the synthesis of proteins, that is translation with uh, polyribosomes, um, and also with ribosomes associated with the ER, this will, really, this will remove that uh, suppression, okay? But our ceramide has another role. And so this was all sphingosine one phosphate working through its receptors and working with or without AKT, right? All right. But notice that sphingosine one phosphate has a direct modulatory effect on mTORC as well. So through its receptors and also directly. All right. And I mentioned this last time, yesterday. So we stimulate transcription and translation because it blocked the 4E binding protein, which itself is an inhibitor of eukaryotic translation. I just said that. Okay, 4-EBP1 can react positively to the presence of ceramide. That means that ceramide will now turn back on this uh, ability of this binding protein to suppress translation. Okay, so now sphingosine 1-phosphate and ceramide are acting in contrarian first premise. Okay, that's an important issue there. So let's move that ahead. <clears throat> Now, there's another component here. That's a sterile regulatory element binding protein. It's a transcription factor, okay? And when mTORC turns that on, this actually opens up chromatin remodeling and allows for lipogenesis, both cholesterol genesis and fatty acid synthesis, glycerol, glycerol lipid synthesis as well as sphingo lipid synthesis. You get the idea. This is all anabolic, right? So, um, again, this is a very important thing that mTOR does. It, it, it's, a, it's a lipogenic or anabolic in all levels, protein synthesis, lipid synthesis, because basically it's setting up for that cell to have a potential of dividing, right? You're setting up in the cell cycle to get into that um, uh, phase where you can then turn on cell division and you can do a replication. Now, NF-kappa B over here, Right? We've heard of this before in our immune lectures. And if kappa B modulates glycolysis, and I also talked about that many times, uh, by controlling the hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha, shown here. So NF kappa B will stimulate HIF 1 alpha, and that will stimulate glycolysis. Now, why is that important? Well, hypoxia initiation factor, remember that you don't need molecular oxygen for glycolysis. Remember, in your um, uh, composite, straightforward, 
biochemistry lectures that I also give here. Um, certainly have given for decades now. Glycolysis works anaerobically. Right? Now that's in times of stress, but that's also when you have uh, oxygen limiting for other reasons, right? Such as in the skeletal muscle. But it also simply means that that transcription factor, that if one alpha, will basically just function in the absence of molecular oxygen, or actually it will work in the presence of molecular oxygen. The important point here is that glycolysis is served and is turned on, okay? Again, ana anabolic, because glycolysis, although it's doing some oxidation of glucose, of course, can lead to pyruvate, pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, oxalacetic acid, TCA cycle, citrate, citrate, leaving the mitochondrion and then carrying out, yeah, lipogenesis, being the carbon source for the proteins that are going to be transcribed because of SREBP1C. All right. So all of that you get, right? Um, also, uh, NF-kappa-B can induce inflammation. Now, we know that. Uh, in epithelial cells, in neurons, and in microglia in particular, right? this is all in the central nervous system, but also, of course, in the frank uh, immune cell lineage. Okay? So that can induce some oxidative stress. Right? Now, that's because NF-kappa-B is a transcription factor that turns on some pro-inflammatory cytokines. So if you have the correct um, transcriptional repertoire that is the chromatin remodeling necessary to synthesize proteins such as pro-inflammatory cytokines in the right cell lineage, you will then do that. It doesn't mean that all cells will do it at all times. But this is enhanced as one ages. Okay? So microglia are more prone to pro-inflammatory responses once the central nervous system ages. That's because the machinery that normally controls inflammation starts to lose its integrity. Okay? That's an important thing to keep in mind. So 2 and 1 is also functioning here. So NF-kappa B will turn on to 2 and 1. Remember, it's a deacetylase. And that deacetylase will block FOXO1. And FOXO1 and FOXO3A, okay, both of those combined would normally work through these uh, sphingosine 1-phosphate uh, receptors, receptor 1 and receptor 4. So blocking FOXO1 because of CERT, right, it's going to prevent the full activation of those receptors. It's going to be downstream mediated responses of sphingosine 1-phosphate. This is another part of the rheostatic control, or if you want a feedback inhibition long-term, right? So these are transcription factors, these FOX ones. Right? So somewhere in there it's going to tell you that. There you go. All right. Um, and there you go, FOXOs, which feedback signal to the receptors. Okay, I just said that. And there's also an antioxidative enzyme, glutathione peroxidase, which is over here with NF-kappa B, and also the manganese superoxide dismutase. And that's going to help e e ameliorate some of the oxidative stress that's generated because of the pro-inflammatory response because of this global transcription factor, NF-kappa B. So it's going to be a regulatory control over or suppression control over that induction of inflammation. Remember, inflammation is always turned on in high anabolic states, primarily because of the rapid turnover and the expression of proteins that can sometimes go into the misfolding process, as you see up here, because you get a lot of activity. That means you can make more mistakes at the transcription translational level and post-translational level. So the inflammatory response is there to be able to regulate the potential for toxicity, not just proteotoxicity, but lipotoxicity, and overall uh, an inappropriate pathophysiological association of protein synthesis that is no longer necessary or deemed necessary for the cell cycle, right? as well as just the increase in reactive oxygen, which of course is going to be controlled by the glutathione peroxidase and by the superoxide dismutase, which are turned on directly by NF-kappa B as well. Okay? So the key features you see here are you have a modulation, a huge modulation over the semtorque pathway. So it certainly isn't in one valence, right? And so any deterioration is very complex, highly regulated system, uh, which exerts control over uh, cellular fate, is going to be impacted during cellular aging or senescence. So that then will lead to uh, an enhancement either of autophagy leading to apoptosis or cell death, such as neurodegeneration, which occurs in the aging brain in humans, 
as well as the potential for oncogenesis, right? Just by a slight alteration of the valency of this tightly regulated pathway. And remember that ceramide and sphingosine 1-phosphate are major controllers here. That's what I'm trying to show you here. It's not often described, certainly not in biochemistry uh, canonical textbooks or even medical biochemistry textbooks. The true significance of sphingolipid intermediates, not just sphingomyelin being necessary for certain axons, right, the myelinated sheath and, and whatnot, but how sphingomyelin breakdown and the biosynthesis of sphingomyelin through the ceramide sphingosine pathways, which are, of course, canonical and necessary, can lead to a whole host of lipid mediators, which are used not uh, off-label, but all the time to regulate the responses and the central nervous system. This is just one window to it, okay? Now, <clears throat> this diagram is showing you how there is a specific carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1C, which is shown here, associated with the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, remember what carnitine palmitoyl transferase does. It allows for acyl coags that are in the cytoplasm to enter the mitochondrion, or over here on the left, to enter the endoplasmic reticulum. Because the novo fatty acid synthesis and the uptake of fatty acids from the external milieu are all first resident in the cytoplasm, right? So this is related to ghrelin, right? Now remember, ghrelin is the what? It is the orexigenic signaling pathway, right? And it occurs in the hypothalamus. Now notice that this is again, of course, in the central nervous system in the brain. Now here I'm showing you the CPTC1 is regulated by ceramide, and that's going to then impact on the ghrelin or exogenic or feeding response pathway coming from gastric synthesized ghrelin. Okay, so you see ghrelin moves in, turns on CERT1. Put on my glasses here. CERT1 then activates P53. P53 uh, allows for the phosphorylation of AMP kinase, and AMP kinase blocks acetylcholine carboxylase. Now, acetylcholine carboxylase, as I've said, I about a thousand times when I said it once, is a rate limiting reaction for de novo fatty acid synthesis, cytosolic in mammals and the animals in general. That will, without acetylcholine carboxylation, won't make malonyl CoA. Now, if you don't have malonyl CoA, you're not going to block carnitine palmitoyl transferase, okay? So this is the whole point here. So the gastric hormone ghrelin, functioning through the acetylcholine carboxylase, stimulates the hypothalamic CERT1 P53 AMP kinase, that's just what I went through here, lead to decreased levels of the hypothalamic malonyl CoA, okay? Because you're not gonna have less of that, right? So it won't be able to carry out this blockade. Uh, and because that's the physiological inhibitor of CPT1. So it will de-inhibit CPT1A. Now that's your normal carnitine palmitoyl transferase, normal meaning the one that's used in the mitochondria to generate fatty acids to be, sent to, to be, to be translocated into the mitosol for what? Beta oxidation of fatty acids, right? Beta oxidation of fatty acids. That's what it's going to turn on. So ghrelin is going to turn on. Do you see? Okay. Um, and potentially, you're going to get more reactive oxygen, because this is, again, in the hypothalamus, not such a good thing, high levels of reactive oxygen, because you're now starting to do a lot of beta oxidation of fatty acids, you're making a lot more NADH and FADH2, and the lack of complete reoxidation of those two nucleotides, nicotinamide and flavonide and dinucleotide reduced forms, uh, through the electron transport chain to make ATP, be oxidative phosphorylation, you're going to make some potentially... Um, partially reduced forms of molecular oxygen, and that's what ROS is. And remember that reactive oxygen can cause uh, auto oxidation and disruption of nucleic acids, proteins, and lipids. Okay, at the bare minimum, which are toxic, right? So it also, though, malonocoy normally also blocks current carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1C. That's the ER associated one. So what's this one doing, right? Because you think about the mitochondria doing with beta oxidation, what's happening in the ER? This is the important and point of this paper. This was published in Diabetes First in 2013, so it's been a while. This is really important to understand the, the nitty-gritty of how lipids are everywhere involved in metabolism and gene expression and in control of the neuroendocrine pathways, which I'm showing you here. Gremlin's neuroendocrine, right?
Okay, so all the switches on the transcription machinery of this Krebs system, right? That's what's showing you down here. And the FOX01 and brain-specific homeobox transcription factor, that's the BCX. These are all transcription factors. It's all chromatin remodeling, right? Um, and what it's going to cause is enhance the transcription of the orexigenic neuropeptides, AGRP1, that's the goody regulated protein, the AGRP, and of course, MPY genes in this neuron, right? And these MPY neurons. Okay. What that's going to do is induce in the hypothalamic response induced by, uh, generated by ghrelin, which is the gastric hormone, which is going to turn on the orexigenic or feeding response, right? That's what's happening here. Now, parallel event going through this whole mitochondrial system, increase in fatty acid oxidation, in, increasing in the uncoupling protein 2. Now, that's interesting because that's actually going to dissipate the um, synthesis of ATP because it's going to allow a generation of some heat because that's what uncoupling proteins do in the mitochondria. And it's also curious that that occurs in the brain, but it's probably to... to decrease the amount of ATP synthesis because adenylate charge also regulates the NPY neurons. I mentioned that before too, remember? Okay. So you want to you don't want to have high levels of ATP synthesis because you can shut down this whole axis, you see. So the parallel event though, that's all this. Now back to here. Parallel event is the dehibition of CNS specific ER Contemporary mineral transferase 1C. Remember, that's also like fatty acids they enter into the ER, the lumen of the ER, not the mitosol, the mitochondria, the lumen of the ER, right? Okay. So that facilitates in the ER, finally, ceramide synthesis. And I showed you that last time on a slide, that ceramide synthesis occurs in the endoplasmic reticulum, particularly de novo ceramide synthesis, which is de novo sphingolipid synthesis, right? or sphingolipogenesis, if you like. Okay. So, so, so now check this out. In CPTC, once you knock out mice, you get rid of that transporter, okay, which facilitates ceramide synthesis de novo. When you make a knockout of that at a mouse, or when you pharmacologically treat with an inhibitor of ceramide de novo biosynthesis, ghrelin no longer works. So this shows you that's a very important step, that ceramide synthesis is important. So it looks like that you need both branches for ghrelin to exert its orexigenic effect. Because if you block this, either by making the knockout, so you don't get ceramide synthesis, just because of knocking out that gene, not the ceramide synthase machinery, but the uptake of fatty acids into the ER, so they're going to be used for what? For making ceramide. Ceramide biosynthesis requires palmetto oil coa and if it's a c18 ceramide you're also going to need steric acid which comes from palmitate after elongation right right okay all right so that's what's important here let's see i pulled the paper out from something seven eight years ago now this is something that is embedded in the literature but you gotta go looking for it so i'm trying to give you the full floor detail of what's going on in the central nervous system now remember this is normal physiology now imagine when this starts to become corrupted because of too much reactive oxygen like we are talking about last time, the uncoupling of the ceramide and shrinkosine 1-phosphate pathways, which occurs often. All right. Now I can put some more things together here. It's putting me completely out of sight. So the exposure of cultured NPY neurons to palmitic acid increases NPY RNA synthesis, that is transcription. Remember, NPY is the orexigenic neuropeptide. The effect can be blocked by pretreatment. So if you expose the neurons to palmitate, you increase NPY expression. And that effect can be blocked with pretreatment of an anti-inflammatory drug. So that might suggest that free fatty acids induced some kind of inflammatory response, and that mediates the altered NPY transcription. Now, that's curious. Why, why would inflammation do that? Well, first of all, why are you getting excessive amounts of palmitate into the NPY neuron? Excessive amounts of palmitate can come from excessive amounts of lipid in circulation. That would be a common hallmark phenotype of obesity, of obesity. Right. So the, now think about the age, the elderly obese, the elderly obese, 
prodromal or maybe full-blown uh, obese diagnosed and maybe even type 2D, type 2 diabetic. Very common comorbidity pathologies in the aging humans in the West, in fact, in the whole world these days. And that's what I say here. Obesity is linked to an increase in POMC transcription and POMC levels are decreased with prolonged caloric restriction. Now, remember, that's the anorexic system. Right? So that's contrarian, actually almost contradictory to the NPY axis. Okay. So now you're starting to get, a, get an idea here. Once again, we're back in the core of the central nervous system. So the hypothalamic for hormone, POMC, is enzymatically cleaved to produce, as we've talked about many times, besides enkephalins and endorphins, because that's why it's pro-opium melanocortin. You, uh, you make melanocortins and you make the alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, or alpha MSH. That acts as a CTT signal by activating the melanocortin 4 receptor. Okay, so that's really important to understand here. The full regulation down in these POMC neurons is going to be mediated by the secretion, synthesis and the secretion of alpha MSH. Okay, so palmitate and the pro inflammatory cytokine TNF alpha, shown here, is palmitic acid, which can also cause inflammation. I told you that. So you're going to get the increase in tumor necrosis factor alpha. And palmitate can move right through the uh, Tolec receptor 4 pathway, TNF uh, alpha through its own uh, pathway. It's going to cause cellular neuroinflammation. These are pro-inflammatory responses. Now, anti-inflammatory compounds that have been discovered in the mouse models and the murine models have been things like tocosahexanoic acid, which is an omega-3, Metformin, which of course blocks the ADH oxidase in the first electron transport chain enzyme uh, reaction, salicylic acid, as well as some um, uh, pharmaceutical compounds that are that are under registry. All those are going to block or at least slow down cellular neuroinflammation. This was published back in the American Journal of Physiological and the Chronology of Metabolism uh, about three years ago now, two and a half years ago. Okay. So notice that, too, you're going to get a change in this BMA1 expression, which is part of the transcription factor associated with NPY expression. I told you before that inflammation kicks up, right, with, with such things as ghrelin. Ghrelin will increase cellular neuroinflammation. Fatty acids increase and also function through the ghrelin pathway. We saw how mitochondrial endoplasmic reticulum through the CPTCs, right? So you get MPT, MPY expression in the arcuate nucleus of the, of the hypothalamus. Now, all of that, because you're getting an excessive amount of the orexigenic uh, MPY uh, neuro uh, hormone, right, endocrine hormone, is going to increase obesity. You're going to see it in type 2 diabetes. You're going to get a disruption of circadian rhythm. We talked about the MPY axis in the arcuate nucleus of the uh, hypothalamus. We were talking about biological psychi psychiatry. Remember that whole series of lectures? Some of you apparently really like those. I think they're kind of interesting too. You get impaired glucose homeostasis because you get, remember how, what that does to the insulin receptor in the periphery? I talked about that, particularly adipose tissue and skeletal muscle. So you get this insulin resistance, you get leptin resistance because it no longer functions to make CTT work, and you can get metabolic syndrome as well. That's what all happens by increasing the amount of palmitate working through this NPY axis. Now, oleate, which is a monounsaturated fatty acid, that's going to block a couple of things, particularly in the POMC neurons. It's going to block neuroinflammation in the POMC neurons. It's going to block um, this whole metabolism through cytochrome C, which is part, of course, the electron transport chain. So this will lead to a, uh, a, a inhibition of this whole pathway, this POMC pathway, because oleate will block these reactions. But if oleate isn't present, that's a monounsaturated fatty acid, right? Then you're going to also advance this whole process, right? So let's take a look at this. Palmitate, pro-inflammatory cytokine, TNF-alpha, act directly on the hypothalamic NPY, especially neurons to increase its expression. Increased in MPY is mediated through the induction of cellular neuroinflammation, which we already talked about. It's rescued by anti-inflammatory compounds over here. 
Pomodate also increases the expression of circadian clock gene. That's the BMAL1. Remember that? Way back, way back, like three weeks ago, I talked about that in my lectures, in, in the uh, audio lectures. That, in turn, positively regulates NPY muscular expression. It's all over here. Polyunsaturated omega-3 fatty acid reverses those alterations. Alternatively, in the POMC neurons, this one here, um, uh, palmitate increases POMC transcription through a metabolism-dependent and inflammatory independent pathway. Curious, right? While the monounsaturated fatty acid only will block a palmitate inducing increase uh, in the neuroinflammatory genes, ER reticulum stress markers, and the POMC. Okay, so that's all very important. What what you're they, what you're seeing here now finally is a manipulation of fatty acids along the arcuate nucleus axis of the hypothalamus regulating neuroendocrine homeostasis of the obesogenic versus lean model in uh, the murine system and then observed in the human system. So overeating will stimulate that NPY and it will inhibit the processes that normally regulate inflammation. So you get neuroinflammation both in the periphery and in the CNS, you get an increase in feeding response because of the obesogenic environment because you have an increase in circulating fatty acids. You also have an increase in the biosynthesis of fatty acids because of the dysregulation, for example, in the liver of lipogenesis. And we talked about the liver too, right? So all of this plays out to be very dangerous for the human system because the obesity will then corrupt the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, cause high levels of morbidity because of the major diseases, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, type two diabetes, and of course the possibility of oncogenesis. Okay. Uh, so that was a really key slide there. And I could bring myself back and we go to the next slide. Now, you can see where this paper was published. It's trends in endocrinology and metabolism. Let's go back and do some narrative discussion. Dysregulation of the pro opio melanocortin gene by sustained nutrient excess, like fatty acids, will decrease the alpha MSH inhibited feeding, and that results in increased food intake and body weight. We just went through that. Right? POMC neurons are selectively targeted, of course, for apoptosis compared to the NPY neurons. And that suggests there's a distinct neuronal population that differ in their sensitivity to free fatty acid, probably because of the lack of control over reactive oxygen that you find in the POMC neurons. Now, why would that be? Because the POMC neurons are the anorexogenic pathway. And if it's an anorexogenic pathway, there wouldn't be a need to control reactive oxygen because there would already be a full load of fatty acid in storage, right? Because it's an anorexic system being induced. So the fundamental regulation, the POMC neuron, should be roughly contrarian to the NPY axis. That's exactly how it plays out, right? Whereas the NPY axis is used to this inflammation, so it controls it by producing things like the manganese superoxide dismutase and the glutathione peroxidase. You see how that functions now, right? This is, again, all back in the central nervous system as regulated by the rest of the body, the liver, the skeletal muscle, adipose tissue, right? circulation in general. And the, in, the immune response is overriding all of this, but I haven't brought this back in yet. This is all just tissue interaction, neuroendocrine system, endocrine system, okay? Of course, all lipid metabolism, all right? So insulin directly, now let's check this out, inhibits POMC firing rates via an insulin receptor action on the POMC neurons and indirectly inhibits POMC activity by suppression of the ventromedial hypothalamic neurons. We talked about this last time. That projects excitatory input into those neurons. Now, remember before I told you insulin is not necessary for glucose uptake in the brain? Quite true. IGF functions at some level there, insulin-like growth factor. So what's insulin doing here in the arcuate nucleus? It's not carrying out the, the glute transport so you get high glucose uptake, not even necessary. It's regulating the POMC 
and PY axis. So when I say insulin isn't involved with glucose uptake in the brain, I mean it. But am I saying insulin has no effect on the brain? I never said that. Okay, so that's really important to understand too. You never see this in textbooks or in review articles. You need to be able to pull all this literature together from multiple fields to be able to integrate into an understanding of what's really going on in the brain, either in the healthy brain or in the aging brain, stress brain or non-stress brain. All right, now here we're going to bring in more, so get ready. The ablation of the estrogen receptor alpha, okay, estrogen, that's correct, steroid hormone, as expressed in those neurons, in the POMC neurons, correlates with hyperphagia, weight gain, and yet estrogen also induces synaptic remodeling of POMC neurons, suggesting a modulation via the interneuronal synaptic connections. So there is a feedback regulation of estrogen. Now, what does this tell you about estrogen, the levels of estrogen in circulation, say in postmenopausal women or in aging men? Postmenopausal women, estrogen drops, aging men, it goes up. Dysregulation around the POMC neuron, therefore, potential for hyperphagia. Potential for hyperphagia, because ablation of the estrogen receptor correlates with hyperphagia. See? So ablation of the receptor is the same thing as lowering estrogen. Right? So an increase in estrogen in male circulation will have the same effect as a decrease or an increase in estrogen in the female circulation because of the changeover of the level of receptors in certain cellular beds, such as the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. Ghrelin acts directly on the growth hormone secretagogue receptors. We talked a lot about growth hormone before, way back in the summer, uh, as expressed on the AGRP neurons to stimulate firing frequency and feeding. Plus, gastric adipokine induces presynaptic neurons to release glutamate. Okay, that's the amino acid uh, control over this pathway that I told you about. Free amino acids, particularly glutamate, GABA, and all that onto those AGRP neurons. That generates, of course, a positive loop to reinforce the erectogenic activity of ghrelin. Okay, so that's how that plays out through that growth hormone secretion, which it does in the periphery. That's what ghrelin does in the periphery. That was discovered years ago when ghrelin was first discovered. Okay, so AGRP and POMC neurons sense and integrate diverse metabolic signals by acting as first order neurons, plus they are higher order neurons whose activities are influenced by other interneuronal synaptic connections that are under the direct control of all these metabolic hormones I just talked about. Leptin, ghrelin, etc. Okay. Insulin, insulin growth factor. This nested hierarchy likely promotes categorical metabolic fine tuning or even feedback regulation loops in response to physiological bioenergetic demand. This is all in the normal physiological response. So POMC neurons occur as distinct subpopulation of GABAergic and glutaminergic neurons with the acute responses to leptin insulin functionally segregated between those two systems. So you get metabolic zone H, you, know, you get metabolic and hormonal segregation of the response to the periphery from such things as increase in circulating lipids, uh, including free fatty acids associated with serum albumin and lipoproteins as charged into the triacylglycerol pool, or sometimes in glycerol lipid pools, other than tags such as phospholipids. Okay? So you get an idea now about how obesity can have a dramatic effect on this, but the aging process itself does because of the senescence. Go back to the Midas touch, right? The mitochondrial uh, secretory pathway in the central nervous system after mitochondrial degradation. Right? And also remember how that functions in a, opposition to the SASP, right? Senescence associated secretory pathway. They're both senescence, but they actually work in contrarian. Right? And remember that mitochondrial one is regulated around autophagy or the potential for programmed cell death, and then ultimately neurodegeneration. But SAS can also cause neurodegeneration because it's signaling with pro-inflammatory cytokines through the microglial complex and um, axial network. 
Right. So mTOR activity was elevated in POMC neurons of aged mice. Okay. We, this is a paper published in Neuron back in 2012, a year before the other paper we were just looking at. That leads to cell hypertrophy. So and since increased mTOR signaling gives rise also to hypertrophy, remember it's anabolic, of neuronal cells, their observations suggest that cellular hypertrophy that is getting larger and obesity-related deterioration of the POMC, that's the anorexogenic uh, pathway, might be causally related. So once again, let's look over here. You've got the young tissue where you've got mTOR lower. And rapamycin is showing you you can control it with rapamycin because it's, remember, the target of rapamycin. This antibiotic where it was discovered from. And you're looking at here the POMC neuron firing very rapidly, right? You're getting some movement through the potassium channels. This gradient is set up, right, to control what? <laughs> the action potential of that neuron for firing, right? It's showing you here where the MSH is localized on the dendritic spines of this neuron, right? Okay, now, look at the aging one. Rather than having a lo low mTOR, it has a high level of mTOR, much le less POMC activity. And what that's going to generate, because POMC is going to decrease appetite, decrease the feeding response, because it's low, less activity, you see, firing, that's the firing that you're seeing on that axis there, you get hyperphagia and obesity, okay? So once a person becomes obese, the POMC neurons become um, hypertrophic, and this hypertrophy dysregulates the phenomena that occurs with aging and obesity. So aging plus obesity only exacerbates the issue. So the activation of mTOR signaling in aging mice leads to hyperphagic obesity by triggering the deterioration of the anorexogenic neurons, those are the POMC neurons. Right? Neuronal somas become hypertrophic. Neurite projections have less of that alpha MSH. See, there's less of them, right? Um, and that goes to the PVN. So they become that becomes impaired. And so neuronal activity and leptin-induced secretion of the alpha MSH is diminished. Right, less, right? Potassium ATP channels play a crucial role here because that's all part of silencing the POMC neurons by controlling membrane potential, right? Uh, so, and of course, it tells you that rapamycin can be used to, to study this, okay? So now you get even a further level of understanding at the level of neuron. This is yet another parallax to what we've been talking about, another view, another window to it, okay? That's why I pulled this paper out to show you. So I'm just going to finish with this uh, this uh, on, uh, premise, these these this these few of these factorial considerations before we go into our next level. So the arcuate nucleus is anatomically positioned at the base of the brain's third ventricle. It's posterior to the median eminence, where the capillary endothelium lacks tight junctions. Now, why is that important? Because all we're just talking about is the arcuate nucleus. That results in a gap in the blood-brain barrier that can leak, in quotation marks, or scare quotes, if you will, higher mass signaling molecules and possibly cellular structures, such as exosomes, directly from general circulation. So the hypothalamic arcuate nucleus is a critical mediator of energy and glucose homeostasis. And there are two loci, uh, and then we just showed them to you, NPY and AGIRP combined, and the POMC. That one also has the, uh, the CART uh, uh, gene expression system as well, remember? Okay, so I'm going to leave you with that. I want to remind you that, so anatomically, the way that it's associated, that part of the hypothalamus and that nucleus, the ARC nucleus, right? is associated with a section of the blood-brain barrier because of this, where it's localized to the median eminence where the capillary endothelium lacks tight junctions, you get more bulk movement of nutrient. That's how you get all this increase in fatty acid if indeed there's more circulating fatty acid, if indeed because you have an obesogenic uh, system, meaning you have an overweight person. Okay. All right. So 
uh, hopefully that will have covered some of the reason I went through this yesterday talking about uh, cellular fate, particularly where I was discussing mitophagy, autophagy, and various types of apoptosis, necrotosis, and necrosis, right? Oncosis, all those different modifying uh, uh, pathways that become events localized to the central nervous system that lead to neurodegeneration. And of course, we haven't gone back to that yet, but we will, the potential for uh, uh, oncogenesis in the central nervous system. Okay? Okay. So I'm going to stop here and um, end by saying, hopefully this was uh, illuminating the second part of this uh, lecture. The one was yesterday. This is part two of this. Um, and I probably will go back to audio lectures. I don't think I'm going to do a third video. I wanted to do these two video because of all the uh, beautiful uh, diagrams that we used. I'm also going to start showing you data again. I've been kind of shying away from showing you data because I know that some people find that a little bit uh, obtrusive to understand the concepts I'm trying to give to you. Um, but hopefully this will have given you a, um, a view into how you can understand how the central nervous system can be corrupted by both aging and by uh, obesity right? and other aspects of what occurs in high morbidity um, solutions um, to the pathophysiology that's incurred during the lifespan. Okay. So again, Dr. Dan Guerra, I come to you from Authentic Biochemistry Studios in the Inland Pacific Northwest on this, the first day of February, 2021. Hope you're having a good day, and I will say bye for now.